Hello. Hello. Uh, how are you doing? Hello, hello. Good, and you? We are good, thank you. So you are going to talk about customer lifetime value, email marketing, stuff, jargon, jargon. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, basically how to leverage custom value for email marketing. And I wanted to emphasize exactly practical tips, basically, from the experience working with different direct-to-consumer brands. Okay, great. This is super. Can't wait to hear. Let's go. Perfect. Question. How do I do that? How do I present? Uh, there is the button, present. Ah, okay. That's why. Okay, understood. Um, yes, we see. Perfect. Yes. Cool. Perfect. Like exactly. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. And exactly, I want to talk about how to leverage customer, customer lifetime value and email marketing. I will go sometimes maybe a bit into technical details on purpose because I think they are important to understand the concept and to also to execute on them. So um, maybe a bit of words about myself, how I'm connected with email marketing. Um, the last eight years I spent as a data person in e-commerce. I was senior data scientist at Zalando. I was head of BI and analytics at different direct-to-consumer brands um, in Berlin. So e-commerce brands and uh, where I built the whole BI, marketing, finance analytics from scratch. Um, and my first um, direct-to-consumer brand um, was uh, actually a nail polisher brand. So we started with a nail polisher and then we went into the whole cosmetic and uh, um, decorative cosmetic and um, skincare industry. And after that, I've spent there, I think, like two, a bit more than two years, helped them with the whole BI and also with fundraising. And then I went to... Um, consult um, different e-commerce brands in Europe on, on data and analytics. And that's where basically I got to know lots of teams from acquisition side, but also from, from CRM side. And that's why everything that, I'm, that I will be talking about, it's mostly, again, about the e-commerce and e-commerce brands. So... And uh, while working so for many years already with the with acquisition and with the email marketing teams, I realized that there are kind of like um, three powers of email marketing or of CRM. So of course, the first one is pretty obvious. It's like increasing increased retention and loyalty of the customers. Um, however, for that, the product should be good, right? So if the product is bad, then it's almost impossible to increase retention. So that's why I believe that where CRM can also help is uh, to improve the product. And uh, thirdly, is also improve actually acquisition strategy. So as an example, if acquisition acquires uh, not high level customers or a different group of customers, it's really hard sometimes, or like, let's say bad traffic, it's really hard for email marketing somehow to revive this, um, um, th this traffic and like make them loyal as well. So that's where I think like, um, it's, it's, it's good and bad that email marketing or CRM is basically sits in between of the acquisition and retention. So that means that the acquisition should do good job. The product should be really good as well. And that's where, um, and then the email marketing can basically uplift all those strengths. But for that, again, product and acquisition should also do their work. And that's where I believe also CRM can still have the say and can help improve those two things. And uh, um, that's where kind of the and that's where the CLV also comes comes in place because people talk about a lot about customer lifetime value what it is but not so many really understand how to utilize it because it's people think that CLV is actually should be owned by retention um team so by email marketing which is partially true on the other hand it highly depends again on what kind of customers acquisition brings in and that's where, um, in a second, I will show you like a, an example from a brand um, where we figured out um, with the CLV what kind of 
valuable customers they actually need to acquire. So, and then the the, the, the idea behind the CLV, like the goal of CLV actually of analysis of customer lifetime value is to understand what customers are the most valuable for you because within your customer base, you still have different segments. So what kind of segment is the most valuable for you and where and how to find more of those customers? So if you nail those two things, you basically bring more money for the business and, uh, well, you get a promotion <laughs> in, the, in the best case scenario, right? So that's where kind of the, the motivation should come from. And um, um, I, I would rather first start, and that's where it starts a bit technical right now, as what actually, how to calculate CLV, right? Because if we don't know how to calculate CLV, then we can't kind of analyze the CLV and understand what it means actually. So, and this is example just for a direct-to-consumer brand. So for the e-commerce company, CLV is actually, so you have your revenue, and then you have costs of products sold. So that are the all the costs that you pay for the factory to produce the product. And then you have the logistics and payment costs. So logistics costs are basically the costs for the warehouse. So you have the warehouse, um, somebody picks and packs it, and then and then the um, the tra transport is is ships this somewhere. So that are the logistics costs. The payment costs are the costs that occur on the platform. So Shopify, for instance, it takes like three percent of the transaction for for themselves. So and CLV is just basically the um, is calculated as revenue and preferably without the tax, right? So um, net revenue minus costs for product sold minus logistics and payment costs. So, and this is the real customer lifetime value. Um, and it can be calculated on a customer level. And then you also need to time box it. So basically saying, okay, we have for this, this customer has this customer lifetime value within the first 30 days, 90 days, 100 days. If you don't time box it, what can happen is that you have in your database, you have a pool of customers who have been there for super long and there is a pool of customers who have been there maybe for, let's say, a month only, right? And you want to separate them. You don't want um, to... to them to interfere with each other. So that's why that you calculate CLV on 30 days, 90 days, and 180 days. Lots of tools um, calculate CLV only by looking at the revenue and sometimes even on the revenue with tax. And this is actually called CLR. It's called customer lifetime revenue. So, and that's the thing every time when I look at the new tool, I always see their most probably CLR and it's not the true customer lifetime value because, and the, the difference between them, right, is because customers can buy um, products that are super expensive for you. So cost of product sold will be very expensive and uh, they can also buy um, many products in separate packages. So that means that you have, again, too much of logistics costs. And that's where sometimes customers that have high CLR, customer lifetime revenue, can have very little CLV. So that's the technicality about the customer lifetime value, basically, and how to calculate it. And uh, now it's going to be an interesting example. Now it's going to be a practical example. So. How do you find your most valuable customers? Um, with one brand, um, it sells convenience food. Um, and we there are different motivations why people buy them. So, and uh, we were asking ourselves, okay, how can we find out actually what motivates a customer to buy this convenience food brand? And uh, there is such a thing called post-purchase survey. So basically, it is a survey that appears in the thank you page after a customer places an order. There's this form as like, how did you hear about us? Like through Facebook, TikTok, Google search, and so on. And the second question is sometimes, uh, um, what was the reason that you bought it? And it's normally also a multiple choice um, question. 
And um, so we, with this brand, we asked um, their customers for the motivation. And there were several results. Basically, people said, I want to eat healthier. I want to save time. I want to lose weight. I don't have a motivation. I'm just buying. Um, I want to improve my body. And there were motivations that people also don't answer. It also happens, right? So, and now it starts to be interesting because now you have those different motivations. So you're like, okay, but people who buy with a specific motivation, like I want to save time, how much do they actually stick to the product or stick to the brand? So, and that's where customer lifetime value can help um, to understand, okay, out of all those segments there, out of all those motivations there, which motivation has the higher customer lifetime value? That means that has the cost more loyal customers that come um, back, back, and back. And uh, funny enough, um, so the high CLV customers who will repurchase were the sorry were the customers who said, "I want to improve my body." And that started to be interesting, right? Because um, and again, right, we did this whole CLV calculation, basically exactly how I mentioned here. So. This calculation divided by, I think, um, looked at the 30 days or 180 days and um, did it for every segment of this. So, and this ought to be interesting because so people who want to save time, they don't care that much about high protein share, for instance, right? They can go to whatever other provider to save time. But the people who are really dedicated to improve their bodies, they will see this brand as almost the only brand who can help them with this. So, and that's right. And that's this, again, uh, question of like, who owns customer lifetime value? Does it, is it owned by acquisition channel, um, acquisition team, or is it owned by the email marketing, like CRM team? And uh, that's where I believe that those teams need to work together because once this is analyzed, what acquisition team can do because so again this kind of analysis most probably should be done by the uh, CRM team so once it's done what can be done after that with this is that you go to the acquisition team and you say hey our most valuable customers are actually people who want to improve their bodies that creates this chain reaction that means that we can change our uh, change creatives so what we write in the creatives, that means that we can change acquisition strategy. We can change the messages that we use in the newsletters. And that will help to attract more valuable clients who stick to the brand and who will buy more. And the thing is that right after that, it can be refined because there, when you acquire those customers who want to improve their bodies, there could also be different segments, basically, as why exactly they want to improve their body. So, and that again can be change in the creative acquisition and even in the product. And that's what I meant by like CRM team can change acquisition strategy. They can change uh, and they can change the product for for the best of the company. Um, yeah, the one thing also what I noticed. People brag about their CLVs. So um, when helping companies with the fundraising, I've heard um, sayings like, hey, our CLV is like 200 euros. Our CLV is 300 euros. Or investors are like, oh, your CLV is 400 euros. It's so amazing. The thing is that it doesn't matter how high your CLV is. Everything at the end of the day depends also on your customer acquisition costs. So... It can happen. Um, so I worked with a brand um, that were selling also skincare and they went from a UV of like 60 or 70 euros. They went into higher product, um, high high price product. So the, the other product was like costed really much more or like double of their current AUV. Right. So that means that CLV also went up. However, for that product, you need to acquire also different customers. So for different price ranges, you also need to acquire different customers and your customer acquisition cost will change as well. So with the 
higher price tag, the higher your price tag will be, the higher your customer acquisition cost will be. And that's why what actually matters is the this whole CLV CAC ratio. So your CLV customer lifetime value can be very high, but you can have a negative CLV CAC ratio, which means is that it will take you that means, firstly, that you're not profitable in the first order. And that means that most probably it will take you also several orders for the customer to start to be profitable. So, and that's why um, when talking about CLV, always think, keep in mind this, what were actually the customer acquisition costs. And uh, of course, if CLV goes up as regarding, um, because of the different product range, it's fine that the customer acquisition costs go up. Um, because what I see all the time is that people complain, oh, our CAC went up, it's not good. But the thing is that if you change also your product range and you started to sell something more expensive, it's fine that CAC will go up because you're just attracting different um, customer category. So, and, uh, oops, next one. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so that's it. I think the, the, the whole message of my presentation is actually that acquisition and CRM, um, by working hand in hand, there could be lots of crazy analysis can be done that can help um, find those valuable customers. And I think what I would also want to mention is the cohort analysis. And I know that it's it's, it took also me time to understand what it actually means. That's why um, it will not be technical now, but um, I will just give an example of one um, company that I felt has really showcased um, what is the what, how to do the cohort analysis or what how to utilize actually cohort analysis and how to understand it. And... Um, um, so this company name is Wayfair. Um, Wayfair is basically a platform where you can buy different um, furniture um, online. And this furniture comes normally from the factories. So it's kind of um, Talando style, if you know Talando. So basically, um, it's a platform for, for, for fashion. So and this chart, I know it's too much here. It's a lot of text here. Don't don't worry about the text just look at the lines so and this is and um, this chart is from annual um is from annual um, investor report and uh, what you see here every line represents a year so it's a cohort when the customers were acquired so the line the bottom line here means that are the customers who were acquired who became a new customers of this platform in 2011. And then you see that with every year, um, the line is goes up, 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 and up. So, and this is ideal case scenario, basically. That means that with every year, they firstly improved their acquisition. Um, so they improved which kind of customers they got. They also most probably improved their product and they improved their retention. So, and based on this data, you, based on this chart, you can, or like this cohort analysis, cohort performance, you see that they are like from year to year, you're, they are doing much better. So firstly, the cohorts are always um, higher than the previous one and uh, at the beginning, but also regarding um, how they proceed after that. Because sometimes you can see that cohort starts up, but then they go down completely, but here, they start higher always and uh, um, almost, well, almost always, and they almost always continue also to be higher than the previous one. Um, and this is called actually spaghetti chart because you see those spaghettis and you can do it not only on the year, but also on the monthly uh, level. And for instance, um, I also worked with, uh, with SAS there you could immediately see the improvement, um, product improvement on those cohorts so that those spaghettis would immediately be higher once they improve their product. With the e-commerce, it sometimes, um, it still takes time to see those um, um, those crazy improvements, not like with SaaS. But in e-commerce, I also look um, pretty often, like once in 
two months on those cohorts, how they are behaving. Is our new cohort, is it like monthly cohort, is it better than the previous one or not? Um, exactly. I think I am actually done. And um, if I post actually regularly on analytics and on, on data on, on LinkedIn. So um, if you feel like you're interested in this, um, just follow me there. Thank you, Katja. Um, if I am a small business and I didn't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, was it so hard? Oh no. I actually didn't understand no, 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 no. anything. <laughs> No, I know that these are the things that we need to think about. But uh, is there like a good source where I could like catch on to, to start like um, investing my knowledge uh, into this uh, thing? Because it yeah. seems like really important. Okay, so um, firstly, of course, follow me on LinkedIn, right? So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so there. Are, to be to be very transparent, funnily enough, um, several months ago, I launched also actually um, my own course as regarding how to understand analytics in e-commerce. That where I talk about profit and loss statement, cohorts, retention, and um, how to forecast as well. I think for the small e-commerce businesses, what's the most important is actually to understand profit and loss statement. That's the first thing ever, right? Okay. So that you know how much revenue you get, you know how much um, cost you have and how much profit you actually get out of it. And there you already can see if you're profitable on the first order or not. And that help, and that indicates, okay, if you're not profitable on the first order, how many orders does the customer need to do for you to be profitable, right? Okay. And uh, so that's the first thing, profit and loss statement, right? You can also Google profit and loss statement, you will find there. The, the magic starts to be when you want to start growing because there you're like, okay, we need to, normally it's like we need to invest money and we need to wait a bit till to see the growth. And that's where it starts to be hard because there you need to forecast based on your current customers, especially on the returning customers, because the business will survive on the returning customers. So based on your returning customers, how much money revenue you will make in the next years basically and that's where again those cohorts starts to be um interesting Ooh, i okay. hope i explained it easily yeah, it, it, actually it's good it's good no problems i i'm just thinking as a, like a small business uh, enterprise uh, that um, i don't have uh, usually they don't have like resources to hire talent like you to do all the like heavy lifting so I have to look at my accounting software and see what kind of charts I see there. And if I'm profitable, then I think I'm in the green. <laughs> if not, then I have a problem. <laughs> exactly, right? So basically, this kind of data extraction of this data is also kind of, um, again, for the smaller companies, it's, it's still easy because you don't have so much complexity. So putting this everything into the Google Sheet and just like seeing, okay, how much money can we act, how much money we get, how much yeah. money we can reinvest. That's already basically the, the first step there. Okay. But um, let's take into consideration our company. Uh, we have a wide variety of different clients. We are mostly focused on the SMEs, but we have like really big corporate clients also. And we have this um, freemium segment uh, too, like that the, don't pay anything, but uh, still uh, have some kind of like uh, costs for us. Uh, so we cannot say what is our customer lifetime value we, because it wouldn't be correct. I, I think they are like in the or, wide or, spectrum. Or you have to calculate the medium. Yeah. Do you have some kind of suggestions for companies like those? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, what what you're SaaS, right? So basically, you're talking about Smile as a SaaS, exactly. Mm -hmm. So for SaaS, right, you also have those different packages, right? You have most probably, like, I will talk now in generally, right? So you have the freemiums, you have uh, maybe like starters, you have the pros, right? So um, normally, the 
the premiums are not exactly taken into account because like, well, they are free anyway, right? So you're like, th there is no customer lifetime value kind of like, you can't ad ad attract the, the dollar there. Wow. So what we did once for SaaS is that we calculate customer lifetime value on the ones who are, um, who are paying already, right? And then like, and if you're, if you're on the subscription, so it starts to be easier and easier to calculate it, right? If they subscribe for the month or for the year, um, you see when they churn with the freemiums, you can assume, right? How many customers there will move to your uh, paid version because you have this data, right? So yeah. you can do this, the percentage there, like, I don't know, maybe like 30%. So you can assume 30% will go to the um, to the paid in the next several months so you mm. can also like kind of recalculate then your adjusted let's put it this way clv basically okay if you explain it like this it, it everything becomes really logical actually yeah yeah, yeah. sorry sorry because i know you have worked with like probably bigger bands brands than the whole of estonia together but yeah. <laughs> No, no, but that's that, that's a good question because so the um, it's like once you sit down and once you really like kind of write down this everything, it starts to be easier, right? But the yeah. it's it's hard to get from this like kind of okay, we have so much different stuff. How to get it actually to this easy model? And that's where like first always start with the easy model, and then you can increase increase the complexity. Yeah, yeah, okay. There is also a question uh, from our top uh, asker, Vivika. <laughs> Thank you, Vivika. Have you also done the service on uh, churn customers? Would it be important at all? Yeah, so um, I've done churn customers on, um, on so I, I, have, I have a portfolio of two kind of um, clients, um, client segments. I have SaaS in my portfolio and I also have like e-commerce businesses. Um, with the e-commerce businesses, it's pretty hard to make a customer, a churned customer tell you something because they already churned. They are like, you know, they don't care that much about you anymore. So it's pretty hard to make them answer you something. Um, what we do there is exactly with those post-purchase surveys, um, asking where they know us from, why they buy it. And then also once they get the product, um, you need to start asking them like how they like the product, but not before. If you like what I always get sometimes from the brands before I got the product, they ask me already, how do you like our product? I'm like, I have no clue. I didn't receive it. So it's always important like to follow up on the usage and understand like, okay, is the person using it? Because the customer will only stick if the customer uses the product. If the customer doesn't use the product, customer will not stick. So basically, you need to follow up on this. Like, are you using it? How, what do you like? What you don't like? Um, and from there, you can already derive lots of information. But once the customer churned, it's very hard already to activate them. Um, on the SaaS side, though, it was pretty interesting um, there. Um, because with the and the, okay with the e-commerce, it's also hard to understand if the customer churned or not, right? Because there is no sub unless it's a subscription, but if it's not subscription, you have no clue how long you should wait till understand that it's the customer churned or not. Um, so that's a bit tricky. With the SaaS or with the subscription, it's pretty obvious once the customer clicked, I cancel the subscription, right? And there, there interestingly enough, we did a survey on those churned customers that canceled the subscription and uh, but we phrased it in a way, hey, we're a young company. We want to learn from, uh, from your experience. We want to improve our product. And people answered without any incentive. We, like normally we would also send an incentive like, hey, $50 on Amazon for that particular survey. I told like, let's not send incentive. Let's just like see what happens. And lots of like the percent, the answer rate was almost as high as the um, percentage, as the answer rate with the incentive on the churned customers. I was like, poof, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, and there, right, again, there you can get lots of insights as like understanding why the, again, in SaaS, understand why the customer churned. Funnily enough, um, lots of people just said openly, we don't have money to pay now, which is fine, right? But then you know, okay, 
um, there is an economic situation basically. So with the churned customers, again, if, once you realize that they are really, really churned, you might be able to figure out what they don't like. But it's already too late to ask them already, you know, like, and it's too late already to, um, you can, you most probably it's, it will be hard to reactivate them. Okay. okay. But uh, uh, in your uh, description, uh, it said that you are using a lot of like business intelligence uh, tools uh, for data an analysis. Do you also use some kind of like, uh, okay, AI is a different <laughs> topic, but, but do, do you like see some kind of patterns when customers are maybe going to churn soon and uh, then ask those questions? Yes. Yeah, so um, what you can do actually, right? So if you, again, e-commerce brand, um, don't have a subscription, mm -hmm. you can approximately estimate how long will it take for the customer to use your product. So skincare, right? You have the cream. So you know approximately it will take three months for the customer to use the product. So in three months, you can, during those th first three months, you can already start asking questions. Hey, um, do you like it? You don't like it? Why don't you like it? And blah, blah. So, and there you already get the insights, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, normally in the e-commerce, if the customer didn't buy within a year, it's considered to be churned. Again, right? If the customer purchased like on Black Friday event, like hundreds of your products, then yes, I don't, I will not buy in a year time. But again, like it's basically with those normal products, kind of, it's the normal usage time multiply with like two or three and then like you approximately know okay most probably they churned okay okay good yeah right. I, I had a question and it like <laughs> with your last question <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> yeah okay uh, actually you but uh, if, if you're thinking the sauce then you the last one what you told was about the the e-commerce but uh okay they will they will if you are subscription based they will pay and pay and pay but maybe you have to i don't know look some other symptoms i don't know they are logging in uh less than mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes, yes, yes. Good point. So with the SaaS, basically, exactly. There are kind of, if you're a subscription, um, even if you're, well, yeah, subscription, even if you, and if you have freemium, there you can see the interaction of the customer with your platform. So for instance, um, so with the SaaS that I worked with, there were um, SaaS to create beautiful designs for the um, for the cards, for uh, print-on-demand uh, T-shirts, right? So, and there we have seen that if the customer doesn't download the design um, within, like, I don't know, I don't remember already, like, within the um, one month, then, first, firstly, if the customer will not download the design within the first, like, 10 days, this customer will not stick. If the customer... Um, in, interacted less than x times uh, uh, with the platform on the monthly level most probably he she will turn exactly so on the e-commerce side it's hard right because like they just get the product you have no clue what's happening with the product but on the e-commerce side exactly you can oh, sorry on the SaaS side you can see um what kind of interactions there are and from those interactions you can kind of foresee the the possible churn or foresee the possible um upsell of the mm. like of the higher tier basically yeah okay right. okay point thank you very much katya thank you thank you for having me